Welcome everyone to Have History Will Travel. I am your host, the Wilder Historian, and so far the two sides have been locked in a bloody stalemate on the second day at the Battle of Shiloh. But that would change as progress was made on the Union right flank. On the Union right, the divisions of Sherman, Hurlbut, McClernand, and Prentiss would slam against the Confederate line. Some rebel regiments had gotten separated from their brigades and found themselves alongside troops from different corps or divisions, but it still remained a strong line. Just like the Union troops in the center and on the far left, Grant's right flank would throw themselves up against a stubborn Confederate line. The Confederate left was the least secure of either flank, and many of the regimental commanders saw it for themselves as it was not well anchored. When Grant ordered his men forward, the rebels were not satisfied with merely defending the ground. Generals like Bragg and Cheatham ordered their men forward to stymie the Union assault. A bloodbath ensued as each side threw lead into one another. Shaver's brigade was hit hard by musketry and artillery fire. A shell exploded over Shaver's head, knocking him unconscious. He awoke all alone on the battlefield, seeing neither friend nor foe. His brigade had moved back to regroup amid the chaos of stragglers and unaffiliated regiments. Wood's brigade also took heavy casualties from some well-placed artillery and fell back to regroup. Nevertheless, the battered Confederate and Union forces struggled back and forth, falling back to regroup and then launching another attack, neither side wanting to give in for long. In a unique moment in the battle, Charles Wright of the 81st Ohio remembered seeing a black man run forward with a cartridge box and rifle, placing himself behind a tree and firing into Confederate troops. As he fired away, he would glance at the Union troops, give them a smile, and continue firing. What transpired next was debated among veterans of the Army of the Tennessee, but elements of Marsh's brigade began to break apart and many pointed to the 53rd Ohio as the first regiment to fall back, compromising the integrity of the entire line. After the 53rd made their way back to the rear, the rest of Marsh's brigade began to crumble. Hugh Carlisle, a member of Marsh's brigade, relayed a story exemplifying how battle doesn't allow men to think straight. A comrade who had gotten excited and shot his rifle with the ramrod still in the barrel ran over to Carlisle and asked him if he could use his ramrod. Carlisle told him that he had use for his ramrod and told him to throw his rifle away and grab one laying on the ground with a ramrod. The soldier stated, I believe I will. I never thought of that. Carlisle concluded, after a battle it was nothing unusual to find a ramrod sticking in a tree where it had been shot by some excited fellow. To the north, the Union and Confederate lines were reported to be no more than 30 yards apart when firing volleys. No shelter could be had for the prone soldiers except if within the tree line. To the south, Claiborne's brigade was playing a defensive role until Bragg ordered his brigade forward. Claiborne protested that they would be cut to pieces because their flank was unsecure, but Bragg ordered it anyway. As Claiborne moved his brigade forward, artillery fire shot out in front of his men from their own artillery. They hunkered down in a ravine until the artillery duel was over. When he moved forward, the thick undergrowth prevented him from seeing the enemy, and his men were cut down by the Union musketry. He was obliged to fall back. Further to the north, Lew Wallace's division, which hadn't engaged with the main Confederate line, approached the rebel flank. The troops under command of Zach Dees first encountered this new Federal division, and with pressure from the front and now their left flank, they were compelled to fall back, along with the brigades to their right. Although the attack came as a surprise to Bragg and the other rebel commanders, they worked tirelessly to hold the brigades together despite pulling back. It was a little after noon when Beauregard pulled back and formed another line after Wallace had outflanked him. The Confederate right was still in pretty much the same place as it had been since 10 a.m., but now the left would be tested even more as Federal troops concentrated against it. Russo's brigade drove the rebels ahead of him, but he was running out of ammunition. When his men fired their last shots, Russo asked Kirk to take the lead and he would follow close behind with the bayonet. McCook sent in Gibson's brigade as well, and McCook's whole division pressed forward. The Blue Juggernaut was only halted when Wood's brigade of Hardy's Corps stood their ground and a bitter struggle took place between the two sides. McCook became concerned for his left flank, which could easily be attacked and overrun, but one of Hurlbut's brigades under Colonel James Veach filled the gap. On the Union right, Grant's Army of the Tennessee was fighting with a renewed enthusiasm. Some of those wounded the day before came out of their sick beds to take part in the attack. Colonel Peter J. Sullivan of the 48th Ohio rejoined his command on April 7th after his wounding on April 6th and fought alongside his men 
until a bullet shattered his arm. On the Union right, Wallace made another flanking maneuver to force the Confederates to fall back. Couple that with McCook driving further into the rebel lines, and it nearly brought disaster for the beleaguered gray troops. The pressure was too great, and Beauregard had to pull back his line to another position, closer to the Shiloh Church. During the middle of the day, Beauregard had personally led at least two advances against the Union columns in an attempt to stymie their attempts to assail the rebel lines. But by 2 p.m., the Confederate commander knew that there was no use to continue to fight back. A withdrawal was needed. As each unit pulled back, elements of Breckinridge's corps constructed a defensive line to hold back the approaching Federals. In one of the last Confederate assaults of the battle, Colonel Looney cobbled together around a thousand men, of which the 38th Tennessee was included, and charged to blunt the blue-coated troops to help buy time for their comrades to safely get back on the road to Corinth, Mississippi. 